as to whether or not they were accurate. And this is kind of what I didn't do for a living. And so what happened was I got out there, and I have no idea what I'm talking about. I just talk about the train of thought leaving. It just left the station. It's coming back, though. It has to come back. It's probably going to go in a big circle. But anyways, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a determination of what it is we need to do. We're going to look at the policies and the procedures, as it were, that we find in the scripture on how to pray. But foundationally, we are going to take our time. We're not going to multitask. I'm sure what is multitasking. Out at the Space Center, I began to realize that people had certain jobs. You know what job descriptions are. But in addition to the job descriptions, we want you to go to this meeting. We want you to go to this meeting. We want you to go to the other meeting. You're a little late to that one, Carmen. Yep. And what happens then. We still do that. Of course. It's corporate. What happens then is you lose sight of your primary goal. Multitasking takes you away from your primary goal. I don't care what they tell you. That's what happens. That's the result. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show you through this course how to be of that single mind that God talks about. He says you you can't be double-minded. Another way of putting that is to to multitask. You want to stay in a single mind, but you can't do that without standing on that firm foundation. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what the scriptures are, you don't have a firm foundation. I have an individual in that I know um, in Seattle. He's he's 50, just gave his life to the Lord a few months ago over the phone, and he's always saying, I don't know, how can I trust God? And I, my first question is, why don't you trust in him enough to think that now that you're saved, you're never going to burn in hell, right? Oh, well, yeah. But but how can I trust him for this and that, and all the other situations he's going through? And I said, well, have you, have you read the scriptures that I sent you? Well, no, but (laughs) you can't trust someone you don't know. Mm -hmm. If I were to to come up and say, John, my friend, I've got a check for $50,000. Now, he might kind of believe it because he knows me a little. If I came up to Kathy and said, Kathy, I've got a check for you for $50,000. She's going to look at me and she's going to go, yeah, right. Because she knows me better than John knows me. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so what happens is we kind of treat God the same way. We, we think we can trust him. And let me tell you, one of the things I love about Jesus is he's got this kind of this this subtle sarcasm at times. Mm-hmm. Like when he talks about salvation or healing. Well, what's easier to say? Mm-hmm. Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. In other words, it's easy to believe something you can't see. Mm-hmm. But it's harder to believe the things that you can see, like enough money in your bank account, a healed leg. You know, so these are the things that we're going to learn about so that we can trust him for these things. And then we have to learn, once we've trusted him, how do we communicate with him? And it's like, it's like everything else. I mean, I watch, I watch Melissa and Kendall and I watch John and Carmen. When, when we're having communion in church and they are one during that process. And they become one because of the fact that you're one in the spirit because you spend time together. You know, my son and his wife just celebrated the 27th wedding anniversary this week. And it's, they're strong because they spend time together. They tell the kids, you can't bother us for three days. We're going away. We're doing this. We're doing that. And, and of course, the kids are all full of growth. But they, they spend that time. They build that relationship. You can't have a relationship with God spending 15 minutes a day reading the Bible. You can't. Mm-hmm. Reading the Bible is an activity. It does not produce intimacy. You, 
you want an intimate relationship with God. And do you have to read the Bible to know how to do that? You have to know who he is. He is not going to sit here and quote all this to you. You know, sometimes, but not all the time. So you may as well read it and wrote it down. It's his letter. So we have to develop that intimate relationship. And we're going to talk so much about that, about the time that you have to spend with him in order to do it. If you if you only have five minutes a day, I know you guys have a little guy, you know, and if you've got five minutes a day and all you can do is pick up and read a song, do it. Ask God to bless it. Ask him to, to create that intimate relationship with you. God is not constrained by time. He is not constrained. You don't have to give him three hours. And when I talk about spending time with him, what I'm talking about is not necessarily the quantity as much as it is the quality. Absolutely. You want to have that time when it's just you. So what we're going to do is we're going to start these scriptures and we're going to talk about the foundation for power and authority in prayer. When they ask me to teach about prayer, I knew that I couldn't just teach you the mechanics of prayer, that I had to teach you the foundation of it, which is helping you understand what your power is, where it comes from, how to use it, and what your authority is, who gave it to you, how did they get it, what is it, what is it, so, ready? And again, for those of you who come in, if you have any questions, interrupt me, okay? Because if I can't answer your questions, and you walk out of here with questions, then I haven't done my job. That, that's my, my sole job, is to help you guys understand, okay? So, we're gonna talk about a spirit of power, Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also put in your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Now, one of the things that you'll see, you'll see the scripture on the handout, and then next to it, you'll see a declarative prayer. The reason I chose to do this was because I wanted you to understand that there is a way of praying the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Too many times we read the scripture and then we're like, okay, now what do I do? Do you know? I sit with a scripture and I read it and then I take it apart and say it a different way and then I pray it. And you'd be surprised how rich it is every single time when the Holy Spirit begins to impart to you what that scripture means. And you can do it sentence at a time. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to do that. So. Mm -hmm. so let's pray together the declarative power. I mean the declarative prayer. Lord, Lord to do your will on earth takes your power. power. Your, your power. power. The, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You can do all things, but you, you have given us tasks to accomplish for you. And we thank, thank you for that, Lord. You see how we took that scripture and kind of twisted it? Or as they say in the media, they put a spin on it? Well, we're putting a spin on it that's going to create the power that you need in your life. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that power and how God has imparted that to us. Because God can and does do all things. He is not the sovereign God that we hear the lies about in, in too many churches. You know, he's not a God that says, oh yes, I will allow you to be raped. Oh yes, I will allow your child to be named in an accident. That's a bunch of crap. Don't you believe it? The lie of the Amen. Don't fall. God doesn't cause sickness. God doesn't allow sickness. Mankind does. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into that. Okay, so anyway, so when God has something he wants you to do, he wants you to do it. 
There's a tent. I watched you two interact with the children. Do you know? And watching you, there is an anointing because you're fulfilling God's will. And I and, and it's just so evident. You can see people who are doing things mechanically, and then you are seeing people who can do things because they're serving God with their hearts. And so what we need to do is learn how to tap into the power that enables us to serve God in the plan that he has for us and to do it with the power that he has given us. So the, the, the spirit of God with this power comes to you only one way, and that way is through salvation. Lord Jesus, come live in my heart. Boom, done. Just like that. There is nothing more that you need. And, and there's a caveat that goes with that, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Right now, you are complete in Him. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, He gave you, He equipped you with absolutely everything you need to be able to function on this planet in a manner that's going to bless him and bless those around us. I, I grew up in, in churches where, when I say grew up, as a Christian, not as a child, a child of a Catholic church, like please. Um, when, we, when, we're, when we're told what to do, we find it d difficult to do it. We have to, we have to kind of find our way in Christ to be able to do the plan that He has given us. I, for example, I have a, I have a really good friend who's a CPA. Yeah, she's a, she's a teacher, at, as am I. But she's got a different calling in her life. I can't add and subtract real well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but there are things that I can do. And I also am a teacher. And the two of us flow together spiritually. We have talked together. We've done team teaching at women's conferences that are just hilarious. But the, the whole point is we have come to know what God expects of each of us in our individual capacities. I'll never be like Carmen. I can't dance like that. I wish I could, but I can't. Do you know? There are things that we are called to do, and we have to know what those things are. We have to understand how God wants us to serve Him. And and there are times where I hear people say to me, "All I want is God's anointing. I just want to feel good. I want to feel His presence around me all the time, and I need that anointing." And it's like, no, you don't. God is not a feeling you get. How do you know God is with you? Oh, because I have goosebumps. Oh, a little tear came out of my eye. Or, I know God's with me because I saw the red cardinal in my bush this morning. No. God comes from the power of the Holy Spirit within you. And you have to know he's there or you don't know he's there have to understand that he wants us to serve him. That's what the anointing is for. The anointing is for us to give to others. So it, there's a there's a scripture, oh, I don't think I can find, can somebody find that scripture? It's in Isaiah. It says he has called me to do this and to do that. Do you have any idea what that is, John? Give me a little bit more. Not yet. <laughs> 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 Does any idea of why I have to write everything down? <laughs> if I had my other Bible, I've got it all marked up, so I would have been able to do it. Um, anyway, he has called me to to heal the brokenhearted. Oh, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Thank you. Isaiah 61. I've got to see this is, you know, this is about the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. All right, let's look at that. Bless, excuse me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. People want the anointing and they leave the sentence right there. The Spirit of God is upon me. Anoint me. Come upon me, Lord. Oh, Lord, come to this room. 